Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome friends to this 16th lecture of our course on ADR and arbitration. We will be discussing about the remaining part of recourse against arbitral award and we will also talk about enforcement of awards in this session. But before I start with the remaining part of what we started discussing in the previous lecture, let me go back to uh, the discussion which we made in the previous lecture because if you recall I raised a question in relation to the case of ONGC versus saw pipes in the last class and I asked you to think over it. So, I think let me first of all try to answer it then maybe we will start with the content of the present lecture. So, in the last lecture I said that 34 is a very important provision because it, it, it provides you grounds for setting aside an arbitral award. And, and we said that there are seven grounds which have been identified from incapacity, invalidity of arbitration agreement, due process, faulty composition, exceeding jurisdiction, public policy, arbitrability. So, we identified those grounds in the last class. And then we emphasized on the meaning of public policy of India. We said violation of public policy of India was given some meaning in the statute. It must, the award must not be obtained by fraud or corruption must not violate sections 75 and 81. Then came the judgment of Renu Sagar which gave the so called narrow meaning. It includes fundamental policy of Indian law, interests of India, justice and morality. Then came ONGC in which we said a wider meaning is required, a broad meaning is required, a broad meaning considering that that section 34 is a pure domestic context, it falls in part 1. So, a broad meaning would be fine. And therefore, in ONGC case, one more point was added if you remember, patent illegality also became part of a violation of public policy of India. Then we talked about the, the recommendation of law commission in which they gave a very narrow definition, even narrower than Renu Sagar case in which they dropped two things, interests of India was dropped, patent illegality was dropped and finally, patent illegality was created as a separate ground only for pure domestic arbitration that is an arbitration held in India between Indians which is not international commercial arbitration. Now, towards the end I raised the question, I said if ONGC versus saw pipes is to be decided today what will be the decision in the light of amendments done in 34 and 28.3 what shall be the decision of ONGC versus saw pipes if it is to be decided today. Let me tell you that the ONGC versus saw pipes was actually an international commercial arbitration. It was an international commercial arbitration held in India because one party was a company from Italy. And we know section 21F defines international commercial arbitration on the nature of party. So, it was an ICA. Now, section 34 in, in after the amendment says that public policy of India will not include patent illegality. So, therefore, if today the case comes and if I recall the facts briefly, it was a case in which an award was passed in violation or ignoring the terms of the contract. So, if today a tribunal passes an award in violation of terms of the contract, the first thing is if it is international commercial arbitration, patent illegality is not a ground. So, therefore, even if there is no amendment in section 28.3. Even if today 28.3 says that in all cases 
tribunal is bound by the terms of the contract, suppose, there is no change there. Even in that situation, if the arbitration is international commercial arbitration, the award cannot be set aside because even if it is a patently illegal award, patent illegality is not a ground for setting aside an award in case of international commercial arbitration. The second part of that question was, will your answer change if both the parties are Indian parties? If both the parties are Indian parties, you get the ground of patent illegality. But since 28.3 has been amended, and now today, not including or considering the terms of the contract does not mean violation of 28.3. So therefore, an award passed in ignorance of terms of the contract would not mean breach of section 28.3 after the amendment. Because now the new 28.3 says that terms of the contract are not binding on the tribunal. Tribunal is only expected to take into consideration these terms of the contract. So if tribunal has decided something other than terms of the contract, it is not violating 28.3. And if the award is not violative of 28.3, it is not an illegal award. Even if Patent illegality is a ground for domestic arbitration, pure domestic arbitration. The decision will be that the award is valid because section 28, subsection 3 has been amended. Now, if you have understood the decisions which I just mentioned in relation to possible judgment of ONGC versus saw pipes, in case that case is decided today, if you understand this much, I am sure you have understood the entire discussion on the meaning of public policy of India. That is what we have already discussed and I thought I must answer that question which I raised in the last, last class before I start the present lecture. Now the present lecture as I said is on remaining part of section 34 and I will also talk about enforcement of arbitral award. One ground which is still there which we have not discussed so far in section 34 is non-arbitrability of subject matter. We have discussed six grounds from incapacity to violation of public policy of India. There is one more ground in section 34 2b and I said the grounds of 34 2a have to be pleaded and proved whereas in relation to grounds of 34 2b quote is obliged to take cognizance of those grounds on its own, even if parties do not plead and prove. One of these grounds is that the subject matter of dispute was not arbitrable. And an award passed in relation to such a subject matter therefore is liable to be set aside. But what section 34 says that the subject matter of the dispute was not arbitrable according to law for the time being in force in India. What I am trying to say is, the Act of 1996, the Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996 does not explain arbitrability. It says that examine arbitrability on the basis of laws for the time being in force in India. So, we will have to examine arbitrability with respect to laws which exist. And there is a case of 2011 Supreme Court judgment called as Booz Allen and Hamilton Incorporated versus SBI Home Finance Limited and others. This is a case in which court has identified the well recognized examples of non-arbitrable disputes. We have a list of non-arbitrable disputes and I will quickly rush through the list if you see disputes relating to rights and liabilities which give rise to or arise out of criminal offences. So therefore, first point is offences are not arbitrable. The disputes which lead up to offences or which give rise to offences are not arbitrable. Second category is matrimonial disputes are not arbitrable. Matrimonial disputes like divorce, judicial separation, restitution of conjugal rights, child custody, these aspects are not arbitrable. Child custody is something which must be raised before a public forum. 
always keep in mind that arbitration is not a public forum. Arbitral tribunal is not a public forum. It's a private forum. So offenses cannot be resolved, cannot be tried, are not arbitrable. Third, guardianship matters are not arbitrable. Insolvency, winding up matters are not arbitrable. Testamentary matters are not arbitrable. For example, succession certificate, letter of administration, grant of probate, these aspects are not arbitrable. In addition to the list which is given in the case of Booz Ellen, the list which I mentioned so far, there is an additional point here in which the court says that eviction matters are not arbitrable, tenancy matters are not arbitrable. And the reason behind this is that these are governed by special statutes. On similar lines, you can say consumer matters are not arbitrable because consumer matters are also governed by special, special statutes. So, consumer matters are also not arbitrable. On similar line, what we can conclude is any legislation which is a beneficial legislation whether it is rent control legislation or consumer protection law, any legislation which is a beneficial legislation. The dispute arising out of that legislation is not arbitrable because then the benefit of that legislation will be lost. Such disputes have to go to the forum established by those legislations. So this is about beneficial legislations. In addition to it, you can have few more things, for example, intellectual property disputes are not arbitrable. License disputes arising out of licenses of intellectual property can be arbitrable. So, these are some of the examples of non-arbitrable subject matter and as I said, arbitrability or non-arbitrability has to be decided on the basis of laws for the timing in force in India. Arbitration Conciliation Act does not give you any mechanism or test to determine arbitrability. Now, there is an important criteria given here. Traditionally, all disputes relating to rights in personam, all disputes relating to rights in personam are considered as arbitrable and all disputes relating to rights in REM are considered to be something fit for adjudication by court or public forum. What do we mean by rights in personam? It is these are the rights against individuals. So, two individuals inter se, between two individuals. It is a private matter. And right in REM is right against the whole world. That is right against the property. So, it is a right, it is a claim against the entire world. So, all disputes relating to right in personam are arbitrable generally. And all disputes related to right in REM are considered to be fit for adjudication by courts or any public forum or public tribunal. These are not suited for private arbitration. So this is a broad list of what is not arbitrable and you also have a, a test, a kind of test to see whether something is arbitrable or not. You see whether it has to do with dispute which relates to right in REM or it has to do with something which relates to right in personam and then you decide whether it is arbitrable or not. There is one issue which has been in discussion in many cases. Law Commission of India also made recommendations in relation to it. This is the issue of arbitrability of fraud. In the year 1962, in the case of Abdul Qadir Samsuddin Buberi versus Madhav Prabhakar Oak, the court says that where there are allegations of fraud, that becomes a sufficient ground for not making reference of that dispute to arbitration. So, court clarified in the year 1962 that fraud is not arbitrable. Serious allegations of fraud, if there is a serious allegation of fraud involved in the matter, then let that matter be resolved by the court because these are not arbitrable, not fit to be arbitrated by a private tribunal. This was the opinion. In the year 2010, another judgment called as N. Radha Krishnan versus Maestro Engineers and others came. Supreme Court decides N. Radha Krishnan versus Maestro Engineers and others, in which Supreme Court follows the judgment of Abdul Qadir Samsuddin Baberi 
and says that in case there is an allegation of fraud, the matter is good to be tried before a public forum and not fit for arbitration. This is not arbitrable. Fraud is not arbitrable. Another case of 2014, Swiss Timing Limited. Swiss Timing Limited versus the Commonwealth Games 2010 Organizing Committee. This is the case in which Supreme Court deviates from what it had already said in N. Radha Krishnan judgment. And Supreme Court said that allegation of fraud will not make it something other than arbitrable. Now, while deviating from its own earlier verdict, there has to be some justification. And the justification given by Supreme Court is that the earlier judgment in N. Radha Krishnan is a per incurium judgment. It's a wrong judgment. It's not a judgment which has to be binding on the later courts. It is a per incurium judgment because of regions like court says that while deciding N. Radha Krishnan versus Maestro Ingenious and others, Supreme Court ignored the judgments like P. Anand Gajpati Raju and judgments like Pink City Midway Petroleum case. So, because these judgments have been ignored, N. Radha Krishnan is not a binding judgment and therefore we can deviate from what Supreme Court has said in N. Radha Krishnan. And in Swiss timing, therefore, Supreme Court says that allegation of fraud will not make it non-arbitrable. It can be arbitrated. Now, an important judgment of Supreme Court in the year 2016 comes. It is called AIS Swami, AIS Swami versus A. Param Sivam and others. AISAMI versus A Param Sivam and others, in which it was held that mere allegation of fraud simply sitter may not be a ground to nullify the effect of arbitration agreement. So, there is a classification which emerged mere error of law, mere allegation of fraud, and serious allegation of fraud. According to Supreme Court in AISME, mere allegation of fraud is not sufficient to take to make that matter non-arbitrable. Let me tell you briefly the facts of this case. There was a hotel business. There are five brothers. They all agreed that, this, that the eldest brother will look after the day-to-day -day activity of the hotel. They agreed that a maximum of 10,000 rupees will be kept in cash to meet the day-to-day -day requirements. Otherwise, the day's collection will be deposited in bank in the evening. The hotel business was going on. Subsequently, it was discovered that the eldest brother who was given the day-to-day -day responsibility of hotel business was trying to siphon off some money he wrote a check of more than 10 lakhs in favor of his son and there was allegation of fraud that he did it without bringing it to the knowledge of remaining brothers. It was also alleged that his brother-in-law was under an inquiry of CBI and when CBI raided the house of his brother-in-law, some money was discovered there. His brother-in-law said that this money belongs to Hotel Arunagiri. The eldest brother also gave the same statement. All these are complicating the matter. So therefore, remaining brothers, rest of the brothers, they requested the court to pass an order allowing them to participate in day-to-day -day activity of running that hotel. When the case was filed, the other party requested that there is an arbitration agreement between all of us. Kindly refer the matter for arbitration. Those who filed the case, they are saying there are allegations of fraud involved here. The matter cannot be arbitrated that easily and therefore matter must be tried. Now, this was the factual matrix which had to be decided by the Supreme Court in AIS Sami versus A. Param Simam and others. There are allegations of fraud. There are two parts of the story. One, the eldest brother is siphoning off some money without informing rest of the brothers in favor of his son. And there is fraud involved. The second part where the CBI inquiry is, is, is going on against eldest brother's brother-in-law. 
Some statement was made by him that the money discovered belongs to Hotel Arunagiri. The eldest brother also gives the same statement. So these two are two different parts of the story. Fraud and fraud are involved. It is not arbitrable. That is what they said. And therefore it is a fit case for trial. Now the observation of court is what you have in, on this slide. Court says that it is only in those cases where we find very serious allegation of fraud. It has to be a case of very serious allegation of fraud, not just mere allegation of fraud. What do we mean by serious allegation of fraud? A serious allegation of fraud will make a virtual case of criminal offense, a fraud which is no less than a criminal offense is a serious allegation of fraud. The other point is an allegation of fraud which is so complicated, so complex that it can only be decided by the civil court on the basis of appreciation of voluminous evidences. So there are two things which you have to consider. When does an allegation of fraud becomes serious allegation when it leads to a virtual criminal case or because of allegation of fraud the matter has become so complicated so complex that it cannot be decided without the help of voluminous evidences which can only be appreciated by the court only in in such a situation you can say that the matter is not arbitrable because of allegation of fraud. That is what Supreme Court says. So not any, a, a, any allegation of fraud will be sufficient to make it non-arbitrable. It has to be a serious allegation of fraud. When does it become serious allegation of fraud? When it eventually becomes a case of criminal offense or if it is so complex, so complicated that it can be decided only by the appreciation of voluminous evidences which is possible only in trial before a court. The reverse of whatever I just mentioned is where there are simple allegations of fraud touching upon the internal affairs of the parties inter se which has no implication in the public domain. The allegation of fraud is a simple allegation between the parties having no implication in public domain. Then in that case you cannot say that it is not arbitrable. So therefore, what court says in AISME case is that in every case, in every case there has to be a strict and meticulous inquiry into the allegation of fraud to see whether it is a simple allegation, a mere allegation of fraud or whether it is a serious allegation of fraud. And it is only after that we can be in a position to decide whether it is arbitrable or not. The next issue which we will take up now is law of limitation under section 34 subsection 3. Now if you recall in the previous lecture I said that under section 34 you have to file an application. That application must lay down the foundation for all the evidences which you want to adduce to prove your ground. There is no format given as to what shall be the form of that application. But what 34 1 says an application according to subsection 2 and subsection 3 has to be filed. So application has to be filed in accordance with subsection 2, 34 2 and 34 3. 34 2 because that gives me grounds, 5 grounds in clause A, 2 grounds in clause B, an additional ground in 2 capital A. And subsection 3 is limitation, the time limit within which you can challenge an award. So section 34.3 of the act provides for limitation to challenge an award. But in addition to 34.3, section 43 is also relevant here. Section 43.1 of the act provides that the Limitation Act 1963 which provides for limitation for various suits, appeals, applications and other things 
the limitation act 1963 shall apply to arbitrations as it applies to proceedings in court so the limitation act applies to arbitration in the same manner as it applies to proceedings in court so if it applies to arbitration in the same manner as it applies to court why do we have a separate legislation in section 34 subsection 3 this is the question which we have to answer if according to 43 subsection 1 of arbitration conciliation act limitation act applies to arbitration in the same manner as it applies to court proceedings then we have provisions for appeals applications everything why do we have a separate limitation in 34 3 to understand that we will have to refer to section 29 subsection 2 of the limitation act 1963 section 29 subsection 2 says that substantive provisions of limitation act that is section 4 to section 24 substantive provisions of limitation act shall not apply provided two conditions are fulfilled generally limitation act shall apply but the provisions given here shall not apply in two conditions when two conditions are fulfilled first there is a special or local law which prescribes a different period of limitation for any suit appeal or application which in our case there is a special law arbitration conciliation act section 34 subsection 3 provides it's a special law it provides special limitation for an application of section 34 so first condition is fulfilled definitely merely providing a special limitation will not be sufficient in addition to that section 29 subsection 2 of limitation act also says that the special or local law expressly exclude the sections of limitation act so these two put together will decide whether limitation act will apply to section 34 subsection 3 or not so therefore what all i said in relation to limitation i said in section 34 subsection 3 a separate limitation is prescribed we'll talk about the time period given there section 43 subsection 1 says our limitation act shall apply to arbitration in the same manner as it applies to court proceedings if the entire limitation act applies why do we have separate limit limitation in 34 3 to understand that i referred to section 29 subsection 2 of limitation act 1963 which says that the substantive provisions of this act will not apply if two conditions are fulfilled one there is a special law there is a local law which provides for different limit limitation than what limitation act prescribes and two that special law local law expressly excludes application of general limitation if these two conditions are fulfilled then special law shall prevail special limitation shall be considered this matter was discussed in the case of union of india versus popular construction company 2001 and the question for determination was whether provisions of section 5 of limitation act 1963 are applicable to an application challenging an award under section 34 of arbitration conciliation act 1996 so the question involved in union of india versus Mr. Popular Construction Company case 2001 Supreme Court is whether section 5 of limitation act applies to an application filed under section 34 of the arbitration conciliation act and why this question arose to understand that let us see what is provided in section 34 sub section 3 to understand the issue which i raised in popular construction let us see what is there in section 34 sub section 3 sub section 3 of 34 says that an application for setting aside may not be made after 3 months have elapsed from what from the date on which party making that application has received the arbitral award so from the date when i received the arbitral award from that date i can challenge the award in 3 months time 
So the limitation of three months is prescribed for challenging an arbitral award. Three months from the date when I received a copy of the arbitral award. It also says that in case a request is pending under section 33, in case a request has been made under section 33, what is that request? The request is, I, I discussed it in my earlier lecture, 33 relates to revival of mandate for certain purposes. Because in 32, the mandate of an arbitral tribunal terminates when the final award is passed. When the final award is passed, the mandate terminates. You want to challenge that award. In between, there is a request to interpret the award or make some corrections or pass an additional award. Now, till the time that decision is done in 33, the limitation shall not commence. So, in case there is a request under section 33 to either interpret the award or make corrections in the award or pass an additional award only once that matter is disposed of that your three months period of limitation shall commence. And in case no such request has been made under section 33, then three months time will commence from the date when you receive a copy of the arbitral award. A party receives a copy of the arbitral award. An important So, therefore, the important thing is that the limitation is of three months. The limitation period is three months. Then there is a proviso provided that if the court is satisfied that the applicant was prevented by sufficient cause from making the application within the said period of three months, it may entertain the application within a further period of 30 days. So, you have condonation of delay here. You have condonation of delay. So, the limitation is 3 months and a condonation of delay of 30 days is possible. And this 30 days delay can be condoned if the party who has to make the application explains existence of sufficient cause which stopped him from making the application. So, the delay has to be justified. There has to be sufficient cause for not being able to make the application. So, if the party can explain sufficient cause, then in that case, a delay of maximum of 30 days can be condoned and this is further substantiated, but not but not thereafter. So, therefore, no further condonation of delay shall be granted. That means limitation is fixed. It is 3 months plus 30 days not thereafter. 3 months plus 30 days not thereafter. And I have identified these words in bold but not thereafter because these are important. Now, if you go back to what I said in section 29 subsection 2, section 29 subsection 2 of limitation act, I said there are two conditions which have to be fulfilled. One is the special law must provide a special limitation which we have it here and second the special law must expressly exclude application of provisions of limitation act. Section 5 of Limitation Act also provides for condonation of delay. 5 does not apply to suits, it applies to applications and appeals. Section 5 of Limitation Act which provides for condonation of delay applies to applications. And there is no limit as to delay of these many days can only be condoned. Delay of as many days can be condoned. An application will be entertained if under section 5 the delay is condoned and what is the number of days of delay which can be condoned? Unlimited. You have to explain sufficient cause, that is it. Now, what happened if I am filing an application, 3 months have gone, 30 days have gone, few more days have gone, I went and filed an application, court will ask me for sufficient cause only for 30 days. If it goes beyond that, court will not ask me for sufficient cause. Court will reject the matter. I am saying section 5 of Limitation Act applies. 
Section 5 of Limitation Act also applies with respect to applications. This is also an application which I am filing under Section 34. So, I will use the benefit of Section 5. There is no upper limit of number of days of delay for which condonation is possible. So, therefore, I admit my application. Does Section 5 apply to applications filed under Section 34? This was the question in popular construction case. This was the question in popular construction case. Does Section 5 of Limitation Act apply to applications filed under Section 34? I also already mentioned there are two ingredients which we have to establish. First is established. There is a special law, local law, which provides for special limitation. But merely providing special limitation will not be sufficient. There must be exclusion of application of general law. And that express exclusion has to be there. Do we have express exclusion in section 34.3? Do you see express exclusion here? Can we say that limitation act has been expressly excluded here? 34.3 only says the limitation is 3 months from the date when you receive the award or if there is an application under section 33. 3 months from the date when the section 33 application is disposed of, then it says there is a proviso that a delay of maximum of 30 days can be condoned, not thereafter. Is there anything here which can be said to be expressly excluding application of section 5 of Limitation Act? It does not expressly say that therefore section 5 of Limitation Act does not apply. It, it, it nowhere says so. But then, there is a case called as Vidya Charan Shukla versus Khub Chand Baghel of 1964. Vidya Charan Shukla versus Khub Chand Baghel of 1964 in which that was a case in relation to representation of People's Act. In this case, court clarified that intention to exclude application of Limitation Act need not always be expressed it can be implied also. So, intention to exclude application of Limitation Act need not be expressed always, it can be implied also. So, that changes the requirements of Section 29.2 of Limitation Act. There were two requirements, there is a special law which provides special limitation and it expressly excludes application of general limitation. Now, the second point changes. Even if the general limitation is impliedly excluded, that is sufficient. Now, let us go back to 34.3 and see whether it impliedly excludes application of section 5 or not. If you grant condonation beyond 30 days, 3 months are over, Condonation of delay beyond 30 days would mean that the words not thereafter used in section 34.3 will become redundant. It is clear that 3 months and a maximum of 30 days of delay, but not thereafter. So, if you allow condonation beyond 30 days, you are making these words, but not thereafter redundant. So, therefore, that means that probably section 5, the application of section 5 of Limitation Act stands excluded by implication. Because if you want to save the words which have been used in 34.3, you will have to exclude application of section 5 of Limitation Act. By implication, it stands excluded because otherwise these words not thereafter shall become redundant. Further, the court said that scheme of special law is, is also relevant here. In case of section 34, 36 is also relevant. 36, at that point of time when this case was decided, Mrs. Popular Constructions, section 36 provided that an award is enforceable once the time period for challenging that award elapses. So, once 3 months and 30 days is over, the award becomes final and it becomes enforceable under section 36. 
this also indicates that there is no possibility of extending the duration beyond 3 months and 30 days. Therefore, section 5 by implication again is excluded. So, scheme of the act also excludes application of section 5 of limitation act. Therefore, court said that intention to exclude the general limitation is very much implied. Both the conditions are fulfilled in section 34.3. It is a special law, it provides for a special limitation and it excludes by implication, it excludes application of the general provision section 5 of limitation act. Therefore, section 5 shall have no application, section 5 of limitation act shall have no application with respect to Arbitration Conciliation Act section 34 applications. You can discuss the same with respect to section 14 of Limitation Act, section simplex infrastructure is the case. You can refer to P. Radha Bai case in for the purpose of determining whether section 17 of Limitation Act applies or not. So, this is what I wanted to discuss in relation to limitation. There is one more point which I want to discuss which is there in section 34 subsection 5. It is a new provision, it came after 2015 amendment. Subsection 5 and subsection 6 are, have been incorporated to expedite the whole process of challenging an arbitral award. Subsection 5 says an application under this section shall be filed by a party only after issuing prior notice to the other party and such application shall be accompanied by an affidavit by the applicant endorsing compliance with the said requirement. There are two things which have been mentioned here. Before you file an application under section 34 subsection 5, you must give a prior notice to the other party. It is only after that you are eligible to file an application. Second, when you file an application, you will have to file an affidavit along with your application mentioning that you have complied with the requirement of sending a notice to the opposite party. Now, reading the language, looking at the language of subsection 5, the question arises is, is subsection 5 of 34, are the requirements of subsection 5 of 34 mandatory requirements? The requirements are you first of all give a notice only then you are eligible to file an application send a notice to the opposite party and second you file an affidavit along with your application mentioning that you have complied with the requirement of section 34 subsection 5. Are these mandatory requirements? Looking at the language of section 34 5 therefore, as I said the question arises are these requirements mandatory? We can understand this point with the help of a case of consumer law for example, this is called as Toplin Shoes versus Corporation Bank 2002. The issue was Section 13 2A of Consumer Protection Act 1986. This provision spoke about a reply to be filed by the opposite party within a period of 30 days or such extended period not exceeding 15 days as may be granted by the district forum. So, a reply has to be filed by the opposite party within certain number of days or extended number of days. Now, number of days is not important here. This is what you had in 13 2A of Consumer Protection Act 1986 and the question arose whether the requirement of filing the reply in these many days is a mandatory requirement. What will happen if the reply is not filed in these many days? Something similar to the question which we can raise in 34 5 of our act, which says that you first of all give a notice to the opposite party, then you can file an application in 34. When you file an application in 34, give an affidavit. What if I do not send a notice? What are the consequences? That will also decide whether it is a mandatory provision or not. Now, what happened in top line shoes? Coast says that the provision does not contain any penal consequences for non-observance. Go back to the provision. The reply has to be filed within 30 days or within 45 days if it is extended and court says that no penal consequences are provided for non-observance. 
and when no penal consequences are provided, the provision can at best be directory, it cannot be mandatory. If it is not mandatory, why do we prescribe timeline? If we also want that this timeline may not be followed, there won't be any problem if it is not followed, why do we prescribe timelines? Code says these are a matter of procedure. The object is to enhance the speed of resolution. The object of speedy disposal is, is what is aimed at. But these are only procedural parts. And in the name of procedural requirements, substantive justice cannot be defeated. So the law may say that you must submit your reply within 30 days and if you fail to submit your reply in 30 days, we must not say that now onwards you are not allowed to submit your reply because procedural requirements must not be allowed to thwart the cause of justice. And therefore, it is only a desirability written in strong terms, nothing more than that. You must do it in these many days. What if I do not do it? There are no consequences, but it is good if you do it within these many days. That is the meaning. It is expression of desirability in strong terms, but it is less than any substantive right. It remains a procedural aspect. On the similar line in the case of state of Bihar and others versus Bihar Rajya Bhumi Vikas Bank Samiti, state of Bihar and others versus Bihar Rajya Bhumi Vikas Bank Samiti 2018. The Supreme Court declared the nature of section 34 subsection 5 to be directory, it is not mandatory. Because there are no consequences of non-observance of requirements of section 34 subsection 5. And because there are no consequences, it cannot be a mandatory provision. Yes, it is less than a substantive requirement, it is a matter of procedure, it is an expression of desirability in strong terms, that is it. The judgment is further substantiated by the fact that section 34.1 says that an application has to be filed in accordance with the requirements of subsection 2 and subsection 3. It does not say that the application must be filed in accordance with requirements of subsection 5 also. That also proves that the requirements of subsection 5 are not mandatory. Law can provide for consequences if it wants to treat some provision as mandatory provision. It can provide for consequences of breach. It actually provides consequences for non-observance. For example, in section 29A, which we discussed in our earlier lectures, 29A, which prescribes timeline for passing an arbitral award, in subsection 4, if you recall, section 29A in its subsection 4 says that if the arbitral tribunal fails to pass the award within the given time period of 12 months, extended time period of 18 months, then mandate of the tribunal shall terminate, mandate of arbitrators shall terminate unless the duration is extended by the court. Now you see, if you do not comply with the requirement, the consequences are mentioned in 29A subsection 4 that the mandate shall terminate, therefore it means it is mandatory. So it is not that legislature does not know how to provide for consequences and make a particular provision a mandatory provision. So therefore it is clear now that the requirements mentioned in section 34.5 are directory requirements are not mandatory requirements. In addition to it, you also have subsection 6 which says that the proceedings under 34 must be disposed of in section in a period of one year. That one year timeline again is not mandatory although in the previous lecture I said in order to ensure that the court achieves the target of disposing of the matter in one year there is a change in 34.1 also that while entertaining an application under section 34, the court must confine itself to the material on record before the tribunal and not to go beyond that. 
so that it is possible for the for the court to dispose of the application under section 34 within one year so this is what i had in section 34 there are few aspects which we could not cover in the last lecture for example arbitrability that has to be decided according to the law for the timing in force in india we gave we saw a list given by the supreme court in booz allen the bottom line is you have to see whether it is dispute related to right in rem or right in personam the disputes related to right in personam are arbitrable we referred to cases of abdul qadir samsuddin buberi and radha krishnan swiss timing ais swami the important thing now is to understand the difference between mere allegation of fraud and serious allegation of fraud it is only when there are serious allegation of fraud that the matter may be said to be non-arbitrable. What, what do we mean by serious allegation of fraud? We discuss that. When it becomes an offense or when it becomes so complex that its resolution is possible only after appreciation of voluminous evidences to be done by the court. We also understand the aspect of section 34, subsection 3, the limitation part. We saw the example of Mrs. Popular Construction, 34 subsection 5, 34 subsection 6, these are not mandatory requirements. 34 4 was discussed along with 33, if you remember. That is all in section 34. Now, we will go to another aspect of domestic award, which is called as enforcement of domestic award which is there in section 36. Enforcement of domestic award is there in section 36. Let me tell you the law prior to amendment of Arbitration Conciliation Act. Once an application for challenging an award in section 34 is filed, that would mean automatic stay in info on enforcement. But now the law has changed. An application has been filed. The matter is pending under section 34 before the court. That does not mean there is stay on enforcement, the execution process, the enforcement process may commence. Where will you start the enforcement process, a domestic award in case of international commercial arbitration shall be enforced by the high court or commercial division of high court. As I have been saying, the definition of court in 2E with respect to international commercial arbitration is it is high court. So, enforcement of the award shall be made in the high court or commercial division of high court. Keep in mind that filing of application under section 34 now will not mean automatic stay on enforcement. In case of other domestic awards other than international commercial arbitration, the enforcement shall be done in the principal civil court having jurisdiction. Section 38 of CPC is relevant. It says that a decree may be executed either by the court which has passed the decree or the court to which the decree may be sent for execution. In case of an award, because an award has been passed by an arbitral tribunal, the arbitral tribunal in itself cannot execute the award. So, therefore, section 38 first part does not apply. In the case of Sundaram Finance Limited versus Abdul Samad, it was held that the entire section 38 does not apply to awards. So, therefore, where will I file an award for enforcement is not to be decided according to 38 of CPC. It can be enforced only by the court which has passed the decree or by the court to which the decree has been transferred. This will not apply. It is for the parties to decide what is the court where they want to file the award for its execution. So, let us not go according to what section 38 of CPC provides for. Stamping is a requirement in case of domestic arbitration. Understamped award is of limited value, but understamping or no stamping is not an error which cannot be corrected. But let me tell you briefly that stamping and registration are not a requirement in case of foreign awards. Stamp duty, the value of stamp duty changes from place to place. For example, in Maharashtra, the stamp duty is rupees 500. In Delhi, the stamp duty is 0.1 percent of the value. Section 17 of the Registration Act says an award has to be compulsorily registered if it affects immobile property. 
and in that case if it is not registered it is invalid but all the requirements of stamping and registration are not required for foreign awards so let us conclude this discussion we talked about arbitrability we talked about limitation we talked about nature of section 34 enforceability of award in addition to part 1 we also have part 1a in the act be talking about part 1a in detail i referred to it while discussing section 11 that's all i have in part 1 of this act students are advised to read the provisions of part 1a on their own the next lecture shall be on part 2 of the act that is enforcement of certain foreign awards so that's all i had in part 1 thank you very much for attending Hello, I am Shikha Dikshit, I teach psychology and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I am going to talk about what is health psychology. In the recent past, health psychology has emerged as one of the important areas in psychology. It is a field of study where psychological theories and concepts are applied to understand issues regarding health and illness. The two major themes which health psychologists are interested in studying are the themes of illness experience and behaviors associated with that experience. Uh, contemporary health psychology adopts various uh, and diverse kind of perspectives to understand health and illness issues. These perspectives include the behavioral perspective, the societal perspective and the cultural perspective. If we uh, try to enumerate the kind of topics that health psychologists study, <coughs> the range is very wide. To name a few of the topics, health psychologists study uh, cognitions related to illness that is health and illness related cognitions, social cognitive aspects of health and illness cognitive adaptation, uh, chronic illness and uh, adaptation to chronic illness, disability, stress and management of stress. Uh, uh, health psychologists also study topics such as health related quality of life, social support and various kinds of coping mechanisms that people adopt to deal with illness, illness experience. In addition to this kind of experience, health psychologists also study uh, health, health care systems, health promotion and treatment related aspects including doctor patient relationships. So, as we see the range of topics is very large. Health psychologists also use uh, qualitative methods and they study uh, topics such as narratives of illness experience as well as social representations of health and illness. So, uh, we see that the range of these topics is very large. However, this is not an exhaustive list. More recently, some health psychologists have adopted a critical health psychology approach. These health psychologists are, uh, they offer a critique of mainly of the biomedical and behavioral uh, perspective of health and illness as well as the methods and approach which is used to understand health and illness. So, critical health psychologists focus on the social, cultural and political aspects of health issues. If you look at the methodological aspects, overall health psychologists adopt a quantitative methodology, they also use qualitative methodology and many health psychologists use uh, the mixed method approach.